smartphones were a major technological leap back in the early 90s. All of a sudden, our portable storage capacity jumped from the 3.5 megabyte floppies we were using to over 700 megabytes crammed on this little disk. And it didn't take long for game designers to stop and think, hey, these things are like little laser disks. We could put movies and stuff on them, and we could make kick-ass games out of that. Well, yes, they could put movies on them, but the whole kick-ass games thing just didn't happen for the most part. Sure, there were some early examples in those days of great games with FMV like The Seventh Guest or Myst, but even then the FMV was more a hindrance. But over here, perhaps the pages you work so hard for. <laughs> Look at this fuckstick. Who let him out? Whoops. Back then it was just so awesome to see movies and stuff like that happen on your computer though, but it didn't take long for the novelty of FMV to wear off, and the gaming community realized that they bought a bunch of games that were huge piles of dog shit, and we rebelled against them like when people declared Disco dead once and for all. And what's my payback? A million pounds of tube steak. What? The first ones I got were games with tacked on FMVs like Mega Race. A fairly bland car shooter hosted by the painfully unfunny Lance Boyle. A guy so dreadful he didn't even warrant a cheesy laugh track. Thanks to you, criminals everywhere are turning to each other and saying, I want my mommy. Hey, I'm Lance Boyle and it doesn't hurt a bit. Then there was Critical Path, a game that took me about four months to even get working because in those days, QuickTime was a piece of shit. And even then it was one of the worst games I'd ever witnessed, not only because you died constantly, but because you had to keep sitting through some of the worst FMV acting in history. It's just a game. A sick game. With some maniac pulling the strings. Welcome to my facility. <laughs> I'm General Min. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the wonderful gun. <laughs> And really, once you knew all the patterns and codes, the game only turned out to be like 20 minutes long. Almost as soon as the technology became available, they started porting in arcade shooters like Space Pirates, Crime Patrol, and they barely counted as games. Let's kick some butt. Hey, Roused Hour! At some point, you just played it to chuckle at the cornball acting because, let's face it, you were playing a light gun rail shooter with your mouse. This galaxy is mine! Who can stop this mad pirate? We are huh. under attack. What does this remind me of? <laughs> Roll fizzle beef. Well, the production values for some of these games were huge, and they started roping in movie stars to appear in them, like the Deadless Encounter. The Deadless Encounter starring Tia Carrere in the hottest role of her career is an actor. Yeah, right. There were a lot of others that sort of blurred together in their mediocrity, like Iron Helix, The Journeyman Project, or Microcosm. Sierra made a few games like Gabriel Knight 2 and Phantasmagoria, which were pretty good, but the latter of which also serves as a shining example of why FMV is generally a really, really bad idea. But honestly, the game is this glorious mashup of being hilariously bad, while at the same time being profoundly fucked up that it becomes completely awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you the possessed madman who puts a smile on your face before he puts a scythe blade in it, Crazy Don! <laughs> a woman's body is a wonderful thing, but the head is useless! <laughs> That's right, he's possessed with the soul of a psycho demon slash sorcerer, but sometimes you've just gotta laugh! But this game gets dark, man. Like when Don scalps an old lady and wears it as a hat. Show us a pizza! A little extra sauce, huh? <laughs> but even Don has his limits, and he knows how to keep that pimp hand strong. Oh, you do not get much more own than that. But a lot of people know about Phantasmagoria, but I have a couple favorites not many people remember. 
Take Two Interactive put forward one of the most ambitious interactive movie projects I've ever seen called Ripper, which is a weird little sci-fi murder mystery spread out over six CDs involving the most star-studded cast I've ever seen on a game, including, get this, Christopher Walken, John Rhys Davies, Paul Giamatti, Tani Welch, David Patrick Kelly, Burgess Meredith, and Jimmy Walker. And it's all set to Blue Oyster Cult's Don't Fear the Reaper. Are you kidding me? This game nearly caused a rift in the Space Awesome Continuum. They basically advertised it as a movie, which was genius. Seriously, just sit back and watch this. It's about catching a killer. You know, to catch the Ripper, you're going to have to outthink him. The police bar. I'm sure they're in on it. Run over it, Rock. Look, Falcon Eddie. Well, I think you got it. The wheels of justice may grind slowly, but they're moving. They're moving. Get yourself caught in those wheels, Quinlan. You'll be in a lot of pain. Get the guy out of my head, his stealth, his tools. I've been collecting knives for 30 years. I don't have a clue what kind of blade he's using. He's out. It's on your conscience. He strikes again. Mr. Quinlan, if you have a knife with a man's fingerprints on it, Talk to that reporter, so help me. I will kill you because I know what drives him to it. So don't you dare think you understand that killer. Or me. Oh, that's just brilliant. You could get this in theaters, man. But honestly, don't fear the Reaper. The song actually does have some major significance. The lyrics are key to solving the final puzzle of the game and finding out who Jack the Ripper is. Because the title of the song sort of sounds like Don't Fear the Ripper. Reaper. Ooh, see, that's weak, okay? I see what you did there, but ouch. I even read that Christopher Walken wasn't even happy with the version of the song they ended up using for the game. I'll be honest, fellas, it was sounding great, but I could have used a little more cowbell. It's this weird little era of gaming that's slowly being forgotten, mainly because these games are so hard to get running anymore on modern computers. Computers are actually too sophisticated to run them anymore. Most of these games ran on DOS, which, if you know how to use DOSBox, may not pose much of a problem, but a lot of them were coded to run specifically on Windows 3.1, a titanic piece of shit that ran on top of DOS, and was hard enough to get running at the time. For instance, this is the best I ever managed to pull off the Star Trek Klingon game. Koi kelas pook lod, koi pook bet pook, yak bo mak bo jeshu mi, se mak shu me u, ma shu ma long, e mak shu chu, ne be e mak shu or chon ku, but ma chen den el jo pi, ma fa pu ma di im karek, ma tu tak tu ma de ko ma shu tak, ma o. Kapla! Now back in 1998, Take-Two Interactive released another game much like Ripper called The Black Dahlia. It claimed to star Dennis Hopper and Terry Garr, even though they only appeared in the game for like a few minutes. But what really struck me about a lot of these FMV games, especially the Take-Two Interactive ones, was how many discs they came packed with. Ripper came packed with six, and Black Dahlia shipped with eight. Eight discs. And this wasn't even the most of all these games. You knew these games were trouble when you got them, because you knew you'd be switching discs to go anywhere constantly. There were games like Seventh Guest, Eleventh Hour, Dark Side of the Moon, where you would have to switch discs going to different rooms in the same building. Under a Killing Moon was the worst for that. You know, frankly, I'm pretty insulted. Now hey, don't get me wrong. I loved that game. Under a Killing Moon was a great game, but you'd have to switch between four CDs two or three times just going down the street. No! I remember Black Dahlia having some of the best acting of any game I'd seen. And even though it's agonizing slow most of the time, and it doesn't make much sense, it's easily better than the lame-ass Black Dahlia movie with Josh Hartnett. Mostly, I help out with the hobos. It's pretty fun, and even pretty horrific at times. Especially when the torso killer starts sending you yeah, packages. Man told me you'd give me a nickel if I gave this to you. Alright. 
I'm game. Here you go. Thanks, mister. Hey, what's in here? I don't know. talk during my reviews. Go back to your corner already. Go on, get out of here. Oh, shut up. The interactive movies were the worst, and when you talk about bad FMV games, you're usually talking about these. Probably the most notorious of these was Fox Hunt, even though nobody really played it. It just looks stupid, and I mean dumber than an episode of VIP. It's about some hapless dope who enjoys striking poses like Ace Ventura as he gets recruited by the CIA to track down a supervillain. Mostly you just spin around in circles clicking the use button until something happens. Usually something very, very stupid. this go on any longer. The last game I'd like to highlight is one that I remember very fondly, but nobody else seems to. A game based somewhat on a Keanu Reeves movie, based somewhat on a William Gibson hallucination, Johnny Mnemonic. A game that only ran on Windows 3.1, a game so heinous that installing it somehow torched my master boot record. I didn't even think that was possible with DOSBox, and even when I recovered, it still didn't work. You don't even want to know what I had to do to get this footage. Even back in the day, trying to get games to work under fucking Windows 3.1 was about as fun as getting a tombstone pile driver in a shit-filled toilet. The story is structured almost exactly like the movie. Johnny's a mnemonic courier, a guy who can smuggle data in his head like a hard drive. He has to make room for this information by erasing parts of his own memory and apparently his acting talent. Oh, I got it, Ralphie. And a couple of babysitters, too. Well, what are those They're guarding their property, Ralphie. No, you listen. I'm a dead man if I don't get this out of my head. Just, um, calm down. Calm down? No, I don't think anybody could have made this no material compelling, no but this is just hammy. Now, you'll notice the game is almost exactly like Fox Hunt. You barely even played these games. All you could do was turn left or right, move forward, or just hit a generic use key. And half the time you didn't even know what you'd end up using. Especially in Johnny Mnemonic, where everything is futuristic and you have no idea what the fuck anything is. Actually, there is another key shown in the instruction book that it calls Download. And you'll only use it a grand total of like three times to download the access code. Well, why can't I just hit the Use key? Speaking of which, never ever try to use the computers in Johnny Mnemonic. Because every time you try, the game assumes you're trying to rip the data out of your head, it microwaves your brain, and you instantly die. Oh, this is ridiculous. Why do they even give you this option? You'll find a computer terminal in almost every location, but it's guaranteed suicide if you try it. It's like some kind of idiot trap where you wander into a new room and say, well, hey, here's a computer. Maybe this one will work. Nope. And you need to get your computer to work because you need the three parts of the download code which was destroyed. Luckily, there's an artificial intelligence in the Internet that's willing to help you. But there's a catch. I have the download code. It's stored in three separate data port locations here in Newark. What do you mean you've hidden the download code? Why would you do that? I mean, I need that code before my head explodes. You're telling me you're some kind of artificial intelligence and you can't store and email me three fucking JPEG files? What the fuck good are you? I'm sorry, Johnny. 
<sighs> anyway, to get the computers to work, you need to collect the three components of the neural interface, and without them, using the computers is an instant death sentence. You'd think Johnny would be smart enough not to try plugging his brain into a neural interface without the required equipment, but nope. He's all too happy to flash fry his frontal lobes every time you command it. What an asshole. Wish I could get out of the game this easily. So, the main point of the game is searching for the computer parts. Most of the time you'll just rummage around people's houses and covertly steal their stuff, putting the items into your infinitely deep jacket pocket. And most of the time the game gives you no idea of where you're supposed to be going, what you're supposed to be doing, what items you're supposed to collect, what the items you're collecting actually do, or where you're supposed to use them. You have no control over when Johnny uses them. If he has the particular item at the time he needs to use it, he uses it. If he doesn't have it, most of the time you just die. And when you die, you have no, no idea why you died or what item you might have needed to prevent dying. Why is there money in the toilet? Anyway, you'll die a lot. What'll happen is the Yakuza hitman with a techno whip coming out of his thumb and his sidekick, some white guy who looks like Andy Dick on steroids, will burst into the room with guns and chase you through the level. Problem is, you never know which way to go, and the game is outright merciless. There aren't any hints. You just have to pick a direction and go. If you're wrong, you get shot. If you're right, you run to the next screen and repeat the process over and over again until you've played it so many times, you've just memorized the proper sequence. It's like playing Dragon's Lair without the flashing hints. Do I take the door? Nope. The hall? The window? Oh. I know, I'll grab the gun on the floor. Oh, come on! What's worse is the action is so choppy and poorly edited that it's hard to tell even what's happening. It's so dark and the action is so spastic, these guys could be coming from anywhere. It's like the editor is having a stroke. And once you finally figure it out, the scene usually concludes with either you or your bodyguard Jane getting into a fist fight, either with a Yakuza guy or his friend who looks like Andy Dick. From here the camera switches to this hilarious point of view shot, where you see your opponent juking and jiving. Wow! It's like I'm in the game! It's like I'm really getting my ass kicked by Super Andy Dick! Just check out this amazing fighting engine. There's no health gauge, no rules, no mercy. A lesser man might be scared of Andy Dick, but I am the Lord of Tekken and I will air juggle his ass! What the? Hey! Ow! Oh, what the fuck? What am I? Is there any strategy to this? Well, apparently, yes, there are tips on how to fight effectively. Let's look at what the instruction book has to say on fight mode. You enter into fight mode as either Johnny or Jane when they and the enemy square off against each other. Uh, brilliant, thanks. Uh, both will enter a fighting stance. No way! To fight, press punch, kick, or block when the screen goes to letterbox format. You can only choose one action per opportunity. Yeah, that's what I was doing wrong, because I keep trying to perform the rare simultaneous flying punch kick that I learned from that Shaolin Monastery. And no kicking while blocking, that's cheating. In general, it is best to punch or kick when the enemy is moving away or their posture creates an opening. Block when you sense the enemy attacking. Uh, during the fight, you will see reaction shots. If the opponent is struggling, you are winning. If Johnny or Jane is stumbling, you are losing. No shit. If you win, Johnny or Jane returns to full strength and the game continues. If you lose, the game is over and you return to the main menu. Okay, how fucking stupid does this game think I am? Winning is good. Losing is bad. Pro tip, don't get beaten up by Andy Dick. It doesn't even matter when you punch or kick. It's just dumb luck on whether or not you connect. And believe me, I tried following those bullshit instructions. It's useless. And you might as well forget about blocking. Just jam on the attack buttons and hope you win. There doesn't even seem to be any difference between punching and kicking. It's not like the game's sophisticated fighting AI will adapt to your master strategy requiring you to mix up your attacks into unpredictable combos. What a bunch of dog shit. You'll also fight one of Ralphie's cyborg bodyguards. In fact, you fight her every time you go to Ralphie's. As if she never gets tired of you kicking her ass. The bitch is persistent, that's for sure. 
But no wonder I'm having so much trouble beating her. Look at this. She's got hyperkinetic legs. Wonder Woman! Really, there's no reason to go to Ralphie's. You're supposed to go to the subway in order to get to Spider's place. And along the way, you encounter a crusty homeless man who just happens to be viewing pornography on some VR glasses. And you need those for your VR rig. But you can only buy them if you give him your toilet money. Hey, wait, why is he reaching into his pants? Help! Ugh. You, you made it for your dog? It's a little kinky. Kinky? Working out, but you're uh, whatever. Than my Maybe dog. I can finally use the computer link in the subway. Oh, oh God damn it! You know what? Just give me the fucking good glasses. Give me the glasses. Sorry, buddy. I need it. I'll pay you back triple what it's worth. Violator! Violator! Yeah, violate your mother, you fucking hobo. Triple. I'll get triple. Triple and get your Spend your triple. fucking spare change on triple. VR porn. Oh, and the only place you can go down here is spiders. If you try to go anywhere else, a techno subway kills you. Yeah, mind the gap, I guess. In the future, if you're in a subway station, you'd better stay the fuck behind the blue line. You can stop the trains if you disable the fuse box controlling the electrified rail. But first, you have to get the key from the maintenance locker, which apparently is protected by Zordon from the Power Rangers. Any attempt to use this device without proper identification will result in severe following harm. Thank you. Alpha, Rita's escaped. Recruit a team of teenagers with attitude. Whoa! Do not fuck with Zordon. The transit authority in the future does not fuck around. Okay, then you go to Spiders. Hey, I wonder if I can use this computer. Duh. Duh. It's not true what they say. You don't get NAS from AMP jobs. So then what does cause it? The world causes it! This causes it! You cause it! I cause it! And all the electronics poisoning the airwaves! Does anybody else wish Henry Rollins would just rock out from the shadows and pound this fucker with a folding chair? Why does Jane even like this asshole? They leave you alone to go have sex behind a curtain. Yeah. Which gives you ample time to sneak around his place and steal everything that's not nailed down. But I like to bother Spider all the time just to watch him freak out at being cock-blocked every two minutes. Go away. She needs a rest. Do you mind? Sure. Are you ready to go? I'll meet you at the top of the stairs. Until then, scrog! After that, you finally complete the computer rig, and then you wander around three endless virtual reality mazes until you find the download code. And when you're done, the street preacher attacks. Never call me that. My Japanese friends told me not to touch your head. But they didn't say anything about the rest of your miserable pagan carcass. <laughs> He's a street preacher. He looks like the guy who rents me videos at Blockbuster. Anyway, he's supposed to be this big bad mama jama, but he doesn't even carry a gun. It's the future! You know what happens to dudes who carry punching daggers in the future? Yeah. I never liked mercenaries. But you hired him! Anyway, let's see. Try to run, get blown up, run a different way, get blown up, keep running. Eventually, you run into the guy who can pull the data out of your head, this guy named J-Bone, who runs a group of rebels against the corporate man called Lotex. But guess who it really is? It's Isaac Hayes! I must be carrying the hidden secrets of Scientology and Lord Xenu in my head. Or maybe the recipe to chocolate salty balls. It's really sad when the biggest celebrity in your movie is Isaac Hayes. Okay, so they hook you into the computer to pull the data out. Man, doesn't it seem like we're forgetting something? Oh, pfft, right. Yeah, good job guarding the front door, you low-tech ass-tards. Chef, no! Okay, well, Jane totally owns the Yakuza guy, and Chef tells you to use the mainframe computer as a last resort to uplink the data to the satellite. Hey, okay, no problem. Oh, come on! It's getting to be a goddamn ridiculous around here. Well, before you can use the computer, you have to fiddle with all the controls, setting the power, but not too high or you explode, aligning the dish, 
choosing the only IO protocol that isn't broken, then you fight a Techno Samurai. Wait, what? And then you can finally upload the data. Ugh. Well, at least that's over and the world is safe. Then it's over. Oh, what is this shit? The game's over, dude. Let it go. You are outnumbered and outclassed, brother. No one defeats me. But you fell from a bridge and you're not even wet. This is bullshit. Oh, no. Don't shoot him or anything, guys. I got this. Notice they didn't bother bringing Street Preacher back, like in the movie for this fight, because the Preacher in this game is just lame. It takes you a few tries, but eventually you beat up the guy, they throw him in a chair, and they tell you to upload just something into his brain, requiring me to use the computer again. You want the data? You got your data. Jerry! You heard him, man. Download everything! Pestilence has ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seal, the redness and horror of blood. Someone's receiving. This is Ursula Skye, commander of Colonial Star One. We are under attack. Repeat, under attack. My ship has been overrun by the Black Brigade. Captain Talon is in control of the Star Splitter Cannon. They're beaming colonists aboard the Black Dragon as hostages till the cannon crystals are found. Situation bleak. Deflector shield destroyed. Can't hold out much longer. Please respond. sinister mind has concocted a diabolical plan to exterminate us all! <laughs> Welcome aboard the Black Dragon! <laughs> Pay no attention to this lovely but pitiful creature. Any attempt to come to her aid will be met with certain extermination. You see this black hole? was parallax to this me. Now I will answer him with his own star spinner. This galaxy is mine! Who can 
can stop this mad pirate? As it stands now, it looks as though this malevolent mystery and his armada of cutthroat pirates will succeed. His quest is my greatest, greatest creation. The Star Splitter Cannon. Talon needs now are the star crystals that will arm it. Well, these crystals have been lost for years on different worlds throughout the solar system. We must find them before Talon does. The journey will be treacherous and fraught with danger. There are many foes. Not only will you have to repel the Black Brigade, a formidable and seemingly invincible force, there will also be mutant life forms, sorcerers and mystics with their own bag of tricks. They will do all in their power to keep you from the Star Crystals. Then, of course, there is the greatest nemesis of them all, Captain Talon. But I want you to know, I believe we can do it. You and me. I've got a star splitter here that will blast that robotic space pirate crew out of the stars forever. What I need is a quick hand and a keen eye. What I need is a star ranger. You know, when I look back on all the games I've played, all the horrible games on my shelf, there's still one game, and one game only, that makes me so mad, even after a decade, I, I, I still can't believe I ever owned it. In fact, it's so bad, it's the one game I've ever thrown in my closet and buried under a pile of garbage, because to this day, I can't stand to look at it. It makes me that mad. Why? Because it's the single worst purchase that I ever made. And that's saying something for a guy who's bought both Highlander 2 The Quickening and the Double Dragon movies. What's your fucking game, shithead? Shithead? What's a shithead? You just have no idea. I mean, 14 years ago, I dropped 60 bucks on this game, and it is never coming back. I played this game, and it forever tainted my soul. It's called Microcosm, and this game really marked a turning point in my life where I, for the first time, realized the power of marketing, and I stopped believing all of that, you know, that corporate bullshit, and I became this cynical, bitter bastard who doesn't believe in anything anymore. I mean, this game held my inner child down and buried it in diarrhea until it drowned on liquid bullshit. Why? Because it's actually a piece of marketing genius. They pulled out all the stuff, played every trick they knew, and even invented a few new ones to make this steaming lump of shit look like a hot fudge sundae. Check out this box. I've never seen a box like this before or since Microcosm. It looks like some kind of square donut with a jewel case wedged in the middle. Why? I don't know. Let's check it out. Okay, let's see. Microcosm... Two, a new era in gaming. Three, the ultimate CD-ROM action game. Well, hot damn, it's the ultimate game. Tell me more. Over 500 megabytes of gameplay graphics and sound data. Cinematic presentation of photorealistic images and full motion video sequences rendered using state-of-the-art graphic workstations. Challenging fast and furious gameplay. Genuine interaction with rendered backdrops. And a digital audio soundtrack by the rock legend Rick Wakeman, making Microcosm a feast for your ears as well as your eyes. Is it a movie packed with furiously addictive gameplay? Or a game with visuals to match anything Hollywood can produce? It's a movie and a game! Wow! This game sounds fucking amazing! And it includes a special CD audio disc and an exclusive edition t-shirt! If it comes to the t-shirt, it has to rock! Let's play! How in the hell do you get the game out of here? Oh, you can just pull this inner lid up. <laughs> I didn't think of that. Oh, well. Let's see. Where's the instructions? Oh, you have to open the bottom up, too. But look at this! The instructions are all folded into this U-shape to wedge it into this ugly donut box. And this is how it came shipped, too. Sitting in my closet for 14 years hasn't helped things, either. Fuck! I'm not reading this. 
They went to all this trouble to wedge this stuff into a box that doesn't fit on a shelf and can't actually store anything unless you roll it into a fucking tube. Just use a normal box! Even the soundtrack disc is a total fucking ripoff. You'd think it would actually contain music from the game, performed by rock legend Rick Wakeman, right? Wrong. Instead, it contains just a bunch of stupid theme music from other Psygnosis games, like Shadow of the Beast 2, Pugsy Pyramids, and Lemmings 2. Now, who the fuck is gonna pop a CD in and listen to the fucking theme song from Lemmings 2? Well, I thought I stored the game disc with the box, but I looked everywhere and I couldn't find it. Well, at first I thought the review was ended right there, but lucky for me, some of my adoring fans graciously donated both a Sega CD and a copy of Microcosm for the same console. Thanks, guys! Hey, and thanks for putting your home address on the boxes, too, so I can, uh, one day thank you in person. The first thing that strikes me about this game is that it has, without a doubt, the most boring opening cinematic in the history of games. Take a look. I promise you, I haven't touched this video or tinkered with the audio at all. It opens over this Blade Runner-esque landscape, but there's no music at all. There's no narration, just nothing. You almost wonder if this is a mistake, as if they forgot to add music. Live the good life in the off-world colonies. Oh, Jesus. Can you believe the Fast and Furious gameplay? Sector 1, do you see anything yet? Negative command. There's nothing going on over here. Oh, wow! Nothing's going on! How thrilling! You, make sure Sector 4 is clear. Yes, sir! Sector 3, what is the status in your area? All clear. Do something! Sector 3, check ground level area. This is not a very good sequel to Starship Troopers. Whoa! When your movie is worse than stealth, you've got problems. Okay, a helicopter. I get it! Can we move along now? Oh, this is the most boring shit ever. Is this supposed to impress me? You're not showing me anything. Nothing is happening. It's just buildings, cars, trains. Now, this is the one time you'd want Rick Wakeman to play some fucking music. This is like Terrence Malick directing the opening movie to Final Fantasy VII. You know what's more interesting than this? The DC Universe was gripped in terror. After defeating the entire Justice League, the world was under the thrall of... <laughs> Giant Dizzy Gillespie, this colossus of raw jazz power. Why, who could possibly stop him but Earth's greatest remaining hero? Golden Age Superman! Stand down, citizen. Your weird jungle music is terrifying the people and destroying our noble white bread American way of life. What's this? Could Golden Age Superman be a racist? Can he stand up to giant Dizzy Gillespie? Who can? Let's watch. Oh, great Caesar's ghost. Superman is totally helpless before his giant punch. <laughs> What is this? Earth's greatest hero? Can nothing stop him? Dum 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 When from the hills of Aquilonia comes Conan the Cimmerian. Who are you? Who are you and why have you come here? Why am I in modern Earth?
Ah, you took my father's sword! I blocked you with my shield! Ah, soon, now I will become king of this country by my own hand! Okay, here's what we know so far. Helicopters exist. Well, Dr. Knowles, are we ready? Uh, the injection. Ah, yes, into the cephalic vein. Not having any second thoughts about this. Not getting a little nervous. Check out the dubbing. Of course not. This was my idea in the first place. It's Dr. Frank. I want to get back at him for ignoring my brilliant ideas. Well, if that's the case, you won't mind me bringing a couple of friends in. Just to make sure things run smoothly. I brought Ellen DeGeneres along. Hope that's all right. Oh, I see you've brought Janine Garofalo, too. Gentlemen, say hello to the good doctor. Nobody else was supposed to be here. Security could easily have noticed them without my <laughs> verification. Look, stop complaining and get on with the job in hand. It's like a Godzilla movie. we can movie. all go back to Axiom. Alright, I'm gonna inject into his vein! Lethal Enforcers. Teddy Bubbles. Mr. Anderson. Hmm? Ah, Amy Winehouse was here. So did you get all that? I have no idea what the fuck happened in that movie. Uh, let's see what the instruction manual has to say. This official seal is your assurance that this product meets the highest quality standards of Sega. Oh, that's comforting. Scenario. In the year 2051, the planet Bodor is a dark and forbidding place. Bodor? A single sickly yellow ray of sunlight struggles to pierce its way through the alliteration. I mean, the thick smog and noxious clouds, signaling the start of a new day on Bodor. The population of the planet, the fourth from the sun in the Bator system, rises once again to face the oppressive corporate rule. With 82% of the population living on a mere 2% of the land mass, disease, poverty, and crime are a way of life. The rest of the planet is uninhabitable, not due to natural causes, but for what lies below it, the untold riches which are mined by the corporations. The corporations take what they need from the planet, leaving toxic and barren wastelands behind. The few areas which haven't been mined yet are fiercely guarded, both against invasion from other corporations and from unwelcome William Gibson ripoffs. For a select few, the dark and polluted planet... know that the ideal opportunity was about to present itself. A devious scheme to wrest control of Cybertech was about to appear in Stark's office. In one sweeping motion, Stark would be able to bring Cybertech to its knees and bring Axiom back into the dim limelight of being Corp 1. God, that was horrible, and I still don't know what I'm supposed to do in this game. Well, that's not the entire story. Oh, there's more on the next page. And the next. And the next. In fact, there's 20 pages of story in four chapters of text. Not only that, the book is a four-page appendix detailing the entire solar system and all the planets and moons within it. Kalinor, Ego Nagia, Quiggin? Do they really expect people to read all this? Does it contribute anything to anything? How do I play the fucking game? Well, if you read the entire story, and I did, Another corporation wants to control the brain of the president of another corporation, so they've injected him with an army of robots, and one of them is designed to burrow into his brain and control him. The book says there are five stages, starting in the cephalic vein, going to the lungs, then the heart, and up to the brain. Well, why can't I just be injected right into his brain? Why do I have to dick around with all these other areas? Well, it says in the book, the cephalic vein may be considered a training phase that will allow the agent to get him or herself accustomed to the controls. A, a training phase? Fuck that! Okay. Well, microcosm is essentially the stage in Rebel Assault where you crash into the walls constantly, repeated over and over and over again. 
All you are is a jagged 2D sprite against a scrolling FMV, and you're riding one long, long rail through the entire game. The graphics are for shit, which is par for the course on the Sega CD, but I certainly wouldn't call this unparalleled cinematic imagery and brilliant SGI graphics. I don't even know what SGI is, and I can't tell what anything in this game is. I presume you're fighting robots, but what's this? What's this? What the fuck is this? Is that a jellyfish? A red blood cell with a laser gun? What? Bright yellow syringes? Aliens? Asteroids? Olives? Cheeseburgers with lasers? Jesus, shit! How much did they inject this guy with anyway? And the game is fucking impossible, too. You can't see where you're shooting because you're looking at your ship dead on from the back, and it obscures where your shots are going because the shots are going straight forward. That means when you're lined up with an enemy, you're blocking your own view of that enemy. You can't see if you're hitting it, you can't see if it's shooting at you, and you can't tell if you've killed it. Some of the enemies in this game simply cannot be killed, but you won't know that until you've spent 10 seconds pouring fire on it to absolutely no effect, and it sapped half your life. It's a little hard to explain, but it takes several shots to kill anything. And if you're holding still long enough to hit something, you're holding still long enough for the four other enemies on the screen to shoot you. I can't see anything. And the same thing happens when I shoot the walls as when I shoot the enemy, so I can't tell who I'm hitting. Each stage is literally about five minutes long, and there are no checkpoints unless you can reach the boss. You'll be so close to getting there when suddenly you die, and you have to start all over again. I can't stand this. I can't avoid getting shot, and everything moves around too much to reliably hit. Great. I finally reached the boss, and I'm on my last life. And you don't heal at all. I've only got about one hit left. <laughs> and it's game over. I have to start from the beginning. I can't even look for any passwords online, because there aren't any. Nobody ever beat this thing or cared enough to write them down. <sighs> Gotta stop screwing around. Play this for real. You can collect power-ups like dual lasers when you kill random enemies, but you don't get nearly enough ammo for them, and they really don't help you hit anything. Their only advantage is that you can see where your shots are going slightly better. Most of them don't even do any more damage except the laser and the flamethrower. I don't know why the flamethrower shoots a purple donut, or how you can shoot a flamethrower in somebody's bloodstream, but whatever. I just wonder how much damage is doing to this guy brazenly shooting laser beams into his arterial walls and exploding jagged pieces of shrapnel into his bloodstream. Well, I finally managed to brute force my way through the boss after an hour of trial and error, and all I have to do is get to this portal so I can finally get to the next stage. YOU MOTHERFUCKERS! God, I mean, this is entirely pointless. How am I supposed to dish out any damage without taking it in return? There's just no way to dodge this stuff. And I can't see a thing, it's so dark and fast. How am I supposed to fight? I mean, at least with Rebel Assault, you could... Hey. Wait a minute, Rebel Assault, that gives me an idea. I suggest we try this again, only this time I let go of my conscious self and act on instinct. I literally played half this game without even looking at the screen. Just swerve around erratically. As long as you don't hold still, the enemies can't draw a beat on you and they'll almost always miss. This is the only game I've ever seen where it's to your advantage to never shoot at anything. Because if you can shoot them, they can shoot you. Eventually the enemies just lose interest and blink out of existence. Well, sure, your high score will suffer, but it's not like this game saves high score data anyway. Who gives a shit? The only time you'll ever need to touch the fire button is for the bosses. And actually, the bosses are way too easy. I mean, it's fucking insulting. They only have two main attacks, and their weak points are revealed by gigantic pulsing fuck-me lights. I wonder where I'm supposed to shoot. Die! Anyway, the next stage is the femur. Wait, the femur? That's not in the instruction book. The game can't even get its own story straight. I'm supposed to be going after the robot in his brain. Okay, brief biology lesson, okay? The brain is up here. The femur is down here. You're heading towards his dick. You're going the wrong way. After a couple more levels, you eventually realize that this guy's brains are not, in fact, in his ass. So you turn around and head to the heart. Now, this stage is a lot different because you have to chase some weird gray submarine and destroy it before it reaches the end of the level. Oh, come on. Be serious. Am I really supposed to hit this guy? Look how much this stage is tumbling and twisting. Plus, this guy is juking around like crazy to avoid my fire. It's impossible. I can't hit this guy. It's like trying to piss in a Dixie cup on a paint mixer. You have to shoot him like a million times, too, and he never sits still. This is unbelievable. Hold still, you fucker. 
Uh, the, the worst part is at the end of the stage, he flies into this guy's heart valve and explodes, killing the patient. And this ends the game, regardless of the number of lives you have left. Am I really going to have to start all over again? This is my first time, and I'm on the fourth level. Oh, shit, a password! Uh, where's my pen? Ha <laughs> here we are. Now, something to write on something. Hey, <laughs> a note page. How many ever people actually use this page in the back of the manual? Okay, what's that? Little swirly thing? Well, the password is only four characters, but how am I supposed to write this down? Uh, this is a bunch of whirling circles. Uh, the other is like a gyroscope. Got a son of a... What the? It's gone? It's gone? I can't fucking believe this. I have to play the whole game over again. Why couldn't it just be four letters that I could remember? Why does it only give you a minute to write the fucking password down? If you have to get up to find a pen or paper, you're doomed. Just have it right beside you when you're playing, otherwise you are totally screwed. And after replaying this stage over and over using the password about a hundred times, I finally lucked out and managed to destroy the ship, which leads to the last stage, the brain. Now, in this stage, you fly around the brain trenches like you're in the fucking Death Star while hundreds of robots try to kill you, and in this stage, they're a fucking swarm. Most of them have area effect weapons, too, and lots of them cheap shot you by appearing around a corner and hitting you before you have a chance to react. It's also the longest stage by far. Hey, you think it's smart engaging in a laser war in some guy's cerebral cortex? Well, after all that, you finally reach Gray M, the final boss, and he's got the most obvious blue fuck-me light of any boss yet. It might as well have neon signs with an arrow pointing to the giant light in the middle saying, Shoot here, you stupid cunt. You might think it's over, too, when you kill him, but no, there's a second phase to this boss, but to get to him, you have to go through another stage. And there's no password for this stage either. This time, you have to pass two stages and two bosses on three lives. And even with my zero aggression method, you're still only at a 50-50 chance to get through each level. You'll get so sick of the same progressive rock music, it'll make you want to scream. I don't even know where in the brain this is. Gray M is the hardest boss in the game, but he's still got five fuck-me lights, and he still goes down faster than a Saigon whore. But at this point, you're probably on your last life, and you're probably just trying desperately not to fuck up and get caught by his instant kill move. Oh, I'm sure this massive series of explosions in the middle of this guy's brain couldn't cause any lasting harm. The only reason I played this long is because I had to see the ending. I figured it couldn't possibly be more boring than the opening, right? <laughs> But really, what have you accomplished? What did you expect but another tedious, emotionless, droning scene of unidentifiable shit you don't care about? This is like watching Inner Space while getting a colonoscopy. Initiate beach ball inflation sequence. Beach ball inflation sequence initiated. This is horrible. Okay, look, I'll save you the suspense. They turn you into a beach ball, which somehow turns you back into a normal-sized human being, and it says you win, game over. Man, this was one of the most abusively boring games I have ever played, and there's only one thing left to do. I have got to fill out the comment card on the back of the instructions. Let's see. Any suggestions for a new game? Uh, yes, I would like to play the interactive ritual seppuku of the game designers of Microcosm. Please make this game immediately. If you could change this game, what would you do? Uh, I think I'd like to take a blowtorch to it and alter it. That would help. Oh, but what's this? I see they've made one fatal mistake. They gave me their company's address. Road trip. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Wait, gas costs how much? Ugh, fuck that. Come on, Corhagen, you've got what you want. Give these people air. And now for something completely different. Two white people trying to dance. Here's a man in evening clothes. Uh -huh. How he got here, I don't know. Uh -huh. Man, you want to see him go. Twist in the night away. He's dancing with the chicken slacks. She's moving up and back. Oh, man, there ain't nothing like twisting the night away. Yeah, twisting, twisting. Everybody's feeling great. They're twisting, twisting. They're twisting the night. Let's twist the night. Sewer Shark. I almost don't need to say anything else, do I? It just sounds horrible, doesn't it? Wouldn't you just feel sheepish about putting this game in the machine like Sewer Shark? Really? The, the sewers are not a cool place to be. I mean, they're full of shit. Real shit. Nobody wants to wait around in shit. Super Mario was a plumber, but you didn't see him tromping around knee-deep in sludge with a game called Super Sewer Adventure, did you? You never used the Wiimote like a toilet snake, and you never saw the Ninja Turtles in a game called Sewer Shenanigans. Plus, the sewer level is always the lamest level in any game. I don't get it. You don't understand. I, I can't go down there. I hate sewers. They smell like poo gas. Anyway, Sega started including this game with the Sega CD, as if they knew they couldn't sell this game with a title this bad. Could you imagine trying to talk your mom into buying this game for you, or bringing it up to the counter by yourself and retaining any shred of dignity? It'd be like being forced to buy tampons for your sister, or renting a Steven Seagal movie. This is the kind of game you'd lump in with a bunch of other stuff so the clerk just wouldn't give you that... <sighs> look. But uh, chances are, if you owned a Sega CD, you either played Sewer Shark or Prize Fighter in the store. Prize Fighter is actually worse than this, but Sewer Shark is way, way funnier. See, Microcosm represents the other end of the spectrum, the most boring FMVs ever made, but Sewer Shark? Woo! This game makes no fucking sense, but near as I can tell, the characters in this game are trapped underground in an endless planet-wide labyrinth of pointlessly winding sewer tunnels infested with overgrown radioactive monsters, and they work as exterminators flying a rocket ship called the Whole Hog through the tunnels at ludicrous speeds, killing all the animals they see with a Gatling gun. Apparently they hate it when Minox chew on the power cables, but they don't mind someone shredding the place with a minigun. It's best not to ask too many questions about this, I guess, but I still wonder what I ever could have done to piss everyone off on my first day. Your co-workers are douchebags, man. Hey, listen. I hear they're putting you in with ghosts today. Now that's my main man. He's Free super fly. To ever shoot the tubes. Give him your best stuff, and he'll keep you flying. Maybe all the way to Solar City, huh? Man, she's so tense. Ah! Showtime. I'm Falcon. Ah. You'll be hearing from me. Switch to decaf, lady. Hey, I see Starbucks picture there. Ah. The sewers, it's Bill Paxton. The guy you're replacing? He had that same tough guy smirk on his face that you do. This guy is all Tell up in my you. grill, man. They're out there now, blotting him up with handy wipes. <laughs> the ghost here. I always come back for more. Hoo Well, bye now. Let's go, ah. Ricky. Doing that. Take a deep breath, rookie. Um, no. Uh, <laughs> don't you love the smell of the sewers in the morning? They smell like victory and poo gas. This here's the whole hog. You. I took her apart and I put her back together again. No matter er, what no, no, they no. taught you up a top rat. Fact top that rat. Ain't worth scrap. I got some stuff in here. Not all strictly legal. Hey. But it just might keep you off the wall. Stop yelling at me. Now until you earn a better one, your call sign is Dog Meat. <laughs> Alright, climb aboard, Dog Meat. <laughs> I'm trying to think of something to say that could possibly make this funnier and nothing's coming to mind. 
Oh, you know, this was John Dykstra's breakout directorial debut, you know. Time for a video about sex education, Crash dog meat! Burn. Crash and burn! The sewer jockeys come and they go! But down here, this is the hole! This is Sewer I Shark! You a name. Yes, I had a slide with your new name prepared in advance, a dog meat! And a reason to live! Like Whitman, Prass, and Haddad! You're gonna owe me big dog meat! And what's my payback? Oh, here it comes! A million pounds of tube steak. I have That's no idea what this guy is talking about. Shot. You nail this one run, and we got a one-way ticket to Solar City. Maybe you're good enough, dog meat. Good enough to Let's do find what? Out. Why am I here? Hey, Captain! What the hell is that? You dirty little... Well, I'm working real good now, Mr. Ghost. Oh my gosh, what is that ugly thing sitting in the pilot seat? Oh, what, the Captain. robot has a problem with me too? File. A robot puppet? How lame is that? What? Oh, well, heck, they're dead. Hey, Vern, those pilots are plumb dead. Something down there sucked their brains out. <coughs> Coordinate. Oh, well, not another bug hunt, Mr. Ghost. Bug hunt? That's my line. No dog meat. Catfish needs a trip to Solar City worse than we do. It's awful dark and scary down there, Mr. Ghost, and it smells terrible. Oh, smells God, like poo gas. <laughs> <laughs> Pretend it's a game. Maybe it'll even be fun. Kinda doubt it. Check yeah! it out, dog meat! Man! Big man frightens me. Catfish the ghost, we got a target acquisition down here. Oh my god. Uh -huh. <laughs> Okay, so the game looks pretty straightforward, right? There were a lot of games on the Sega CD like this. In fact, most of them. You're shooting stuff in front of an FMV. It looks a little like Microcosm or like Rebel Assault, and I figure the basic object of the game is to shoot stuff on the screen before they shoot you. Easy, right? <laughs> Wrong. You absolutely have to read the instruction book to know what to do in this game, because the game doesn't tell you anything. I mean nothing. And if you don't know what you're doing, you will die and die fast. The first thing you need to know is that you can steer the ship. The question is, where should you go? After dying a lot and not knowing why, I finally caved and read the book, and it says the robot will call out directions to your destination. But at first I was really confused, because the robot will shout out things at you like this. We got some hungry critters bearing brave, not a brave. Now, at first I thought he was warning me not to go in that direction because there were a ton of monsters there. But you're always supposed to go the way he says. Now, if you forget one of the directions or you go the wrong way even once, you die. There's a small chance the game will forgive you early on, but for the most part, there's no room for error. Cool. Don't let him freak you out! Now, the directions are random every time you play, but the game plays out exactly the same way every time, regardless of the directions, so there's basically no replay value except to get a high score, which the game doesn't save. Another thing I noticed after a while is that the monsters don't even hurt you until much later in the game. The first half is just you blasting helpless rats and bats with a Gatling gun. And tell me, how is this a Gatling gun? They don't even fight back. The game plays them up as being super scary and deadly, but they offer absolutely no resistance. What do these things ever do to us? So I figure, fuck it, why bother? If the game doesn't care, why should I? Well, it turns out that the game does care, because at several points in the game, you're blindsided by FMVs of your boss in Solar City who yells at you if you don't kill enough stuff. That was one lousy run. Why should I waste, uh, waste? Sega Municipal Fuzz has such an obvious boondoggle! That's it! You're a boondoggle! What in the... I need a drink! Ah, and today's... Look at those totals, dog meat! They look reconstituted frog slime! I'm shipping you back to flight school! See how you like flying at desks, squad brain! And just like that, the game is over. You have to start over from the beginning. And the instructions say nothing about this, by the way. So even though reading the instructions is essential, it still doesn't tell you about half the things you have to do to avoid dying. So, alright, if they want a body count, they got one. I start playing through the game with my thumb pinned to the trigger, and I'm actually having one of the better games I've ever played when suddenly... a hey, Dog Breath, or whatever your name is. That was one lousy run. What the, it failed me again? What do they want from me? I had to go online to look for hints. It turns out that all the game really cares about are the Radigators. 
I was focusing more on the bats, I guess, because they just keep coming back and there are a ton more of them. But no, it's just the rats. Again, something the book says nothing about. But that raises another problem. I'm playing through the game when I notice my energy level is getting really low. There are a few recharge stations throughout the game, but one never comes up here and I die. Start over. What I didn't realize was that your energy drains a lot faster when you're firing, which I suppose makes sense, but again, it's another thing the instructions don't fucking tell you. There are two ways to go through each recharge station, but only one gives you more energy and it's marked with a green light, so you have to be fast to get to it. The instructions also give you the impression that the recharge stations are optional, which is a fucking joke. If you miss a recharge, it's a death sentence. You might as well just wait it out, or reset the game. The only way to make it if you do miss one is to not fire at anything, and if you do that in the first half of the game, you won't get a high enough score to pass the fat guy, and if you do that in the second half, you'll just get killed by the monsters, so I guess the only advice is don't miss. Here's another thing I guarantee will kill you whether you read the book or not. You'll be flying along just dandy when all of a sudden, BOOM, you explode! Game over, what the fuck? You have to keep watching the hydrogen meter along the bottom, and when it gets red, you have to mash the button so the robot fires a flare and detonates the gas pocket ahead of you. But why is it hydrogen? Isn't it normally methane in a sewer? Well, after focusing on the rats, I finally managed to pass the checkpoint and move on to the next level, as if it matters. All the levels look the same anyway. No kidding! I swear I know this guy. You're a real, uh... Um... Yeah, you see, uh, I use classy words like that cause, uh... <laughs> I'm a totally, uh... Um... To celebrate, Private Hicks gives you a new nickname. Your new call sign is Rat Breath. In fact, he changes your nickname about four times in the span of ten minutes. Your new call sign is Beach Bum. He's sort of like your own personal Dr. Cox. Hey, I like this name game. I think I'll call this guy Fuckpipe. I'm flying with a menace to society here. These parts of the fat guy just slay me. My favorite part is the ditzy blonde with the good vocabulary. Real potential. What a nice guy. Just remember. A clean sewer is a happy sewer! I almost feel bad for the guy playing Mr. Stenchler. They've chosen exactly one fat joke and gone so over the top with it that it actually becomes awesome. This guy is always eating. Someone get me a bucket, I'm gonna throw up. I mean, he's always eating. Whether he's on the beach, in his office, or even while he's surfing. Look at this pimp, he's riding double on a surfboard with a hot chick, catching a wave with an 18-inch hot dog in one hand. I have a new role model. Now, you're probably wondering where you've seen this guy before. McLean, say hi to my brother, Vito. Merry Christmas. Hi. No shit. No shit! He was also in Total Recall, too. Recall! 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 I always thought that was Danny DeVito. Kind of fucks with your brain, doesn't it? Don't fuck with your brain, pal. It ain't worth it. What's not? Surf's up, dude. <laughs> well, after the second stage, the woman pilot who hates you gets kidnapped by Stenchler. So you go back to the garage where Fuckpipe makes all sorts of modifications to the whole hog. This is my baby. I call her Sweet Little Sixteen. Sixteen barrels of fun for Mr. Mole and company. Okay, here we go. Ready? Three. Two, one, fire! What? You didn't fire, did you? W was I supposed to shoot? What a milksop Millie you turned out to be! What? Get out of here! What? I need a pilot! Not a human dribble glider! You're gonna fail me for that? What? Game over? No! No! Merry Christmas! Oh! Oh, no way, no way! Die now, motherfucker! You lied to me! Nobody told me about that shit! Yeah, you did. I did not! I hate you. I hate all of you. <sighs> well, despite all the modifications Fuckpipe said he made, you'll see absolutely no difference in the way your guns work. The stages all look the same, too, only now you're following a bird to the surface, and there are new monsters that can actually hurt you, like sewer scorpions. Uh, there are also robots that can kill you in one hit, and they will. A lot. You have to be flawless through the last stage, because everything kills you, and you can't take the wrong direction a single time. Things aren't going well on the surface, either. Stenchler wants to tie Falco to a stake and burn her alive for some weird reason, which strikes even the crowd at the beach as being a little creepy. WHERE'S MY anchovy PUDDING?! RIGHT HERE! Check out this delivery. This is... 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 This
this is? Back. Get back! Oh my shirt shall have your brain for birth! <laughs> the shirt my last line of defense! What a beautiful concept! Brain-eating fireflies! Oh. Off to the sewers with you! So, he's got a secret compartment in his file cabinet that leads directly to the sewers. Why would he ever need that? Can you imagine this guy taking a shit in his own filing cabinet? And why isn't he using them against the angry mob that's attacking him? Why does he care about the losers in the sewers? <laughs> anyway, he's dumping what they call zerts into the sewers to kill you. And he must be pretty strong to lift them, too, because according to the manual, the average zerts weighs 50,000 pounds, and they survive by sucking your brains out. Uh, they'll kill you in one hit, too, naturally. Oh, <laughs> damn it! But well, once you get past them, you reach the surface and bring Stenchler to justice. Sort of. The Zerks didn't stop them! They'll be coming for me now! Check out how his office is clearly just a false front. He literally runs away through the missing walls. Your shark bait! While well, we're almost there, Mr. Ghost, it don't smell bad no more. All right, buddy. Welcome to paradise. Oh, now wait a second. Why does he get the girl? He didn't do anything. God damn it. Where's Stensler? <laughs> We're vaguely amused by your attempted murder. <laughs> well, that's it. The world is finally safe from bat people and bats, so I guess I'll see you next time. <laughs> Recruit a team of teenagers with attitude. I thought you were from Illinois. I am. Only guys from Kentucky do that with their shredded wheat. I've been doing this since I was a kid. Here's how we do it in Brooklyn. First, we break them in half, and then we mash them to a pulp. Add some milk, maybe a little fruit garnish. Now, this gun shredded wheat is great no matter how you eat it, because it's nutritious whole wheat with no added sugar or salt. What do the guys from California do? They throw them. <laughs> Recruit a team of teenagers with attitude. I've been playing the Sega CD for a while now, mainly because these FMV games are a comedy goldmine. I was actually going to lay off, but then I was at a used bookstore and I saw this. The Mighty Morphin Power Rangers for the Sega CD, and when I saw this I just knew I had to play it. I didn't even know there was a Power Rangers game for the Sega CD, and I don't really think many other people did either. I have the perfect plan to conquer that pathetic little planet Earth! With the green candle, formed from magic wax, when it burns down it will steal the Green Rangers' powers! <laughs> now I still have a soft spot for the Power Rangers, although I never followed them past the first incarnation of the group. After the first group they started getting a little weird, you know, Power Rangers, Zeo, Neo, Rangers in Time, Rangers in Space, Rangers Turbo. Uh, I didn't really follow it. I mean, I was just a kid when I first saw it, right? But uh, this is the first game for the Sega CD I was legitimately excited about playing. I mean, this is classic Power Rangers. And besides, it's got Kung Fu guys in motorcycle helmets fighting giant rubber monsters with robots. I mean, there's no possible way this kid could suck, right? Well, let's play it. It's Morphin' Time! Mastodon! Pterodactyl! Triceratops! Saber-Tooth Tiger! Piranha 
Score! For those of you who aren't familiar with the Power Rangers, it's about this evil sorceress named Rita Repulsa who's been stuck in a jar for 10,000 years. And when she gets out, she wants to do two things. Take a shower and conquer Earth. To combat her and her never-ending supply of putties and rubber monsters, there's a giant floating blue head named Zordon who gives a group of random teenagers from a nearby high school magic morphing belt buckles that turns them into spandex-clad warriors and motorcycle helmets. Actually, Zordon kind of lucks out by managing to pull a bunch of random teens who happen to know martial arts. You'd think Zordon would be a lot smarter to say something like, Alpha, Rita's escaped. Bring me the five greatest martial artists on the planet. Or, Alpha, get me Chuck Norris, Jet Li, Steven Seagal, Triple H, and Bruce Campbell. Yeah. You've been chosen to form an elite team to battle Rita. Each of you will be given access to extraordinary powers drawn from the ancient creatures you call dinosaurs. Dinosaurs? Yeah, oh. dinosaurs, except for the Mastodon and the Sabertooth Tiger, which aren't dinosaurs. I never really understood what the Green Ranger's thing was. He doesn't even fit into the whole dinosaur theme. He just yells, Dragonsaur! <laughs> And I have no idea where dragons fit into the whole dinosaur thing. And he plays this magic dagger flute. The game has three difficulty levels, and I immediately choose hard, because I'm hardcore and that's how I roll! The game opens up by playing the first few scenes from the first episode. In fact, the cutscenes never, ever stop. The entire game is cutscenes. It's an FMV, unbroken, from beginning to end. And it's very simple. Arrows and buttons appear on the screen, and you have to push them before they disappear, or you take a hit. If your life bar runs out, it's game over. That's it. Monkey C button, monkey push button. Except on the hard difficulty where it's all too fucking fast, there's no way to see these moves coming. I mean, the movie offers a few visual cues, but it doesn't really help. And worse, on this difficulty level, you take a hit for every wrong button you press, and you take an additional hit for not pressing the correct one. So when things start getting frantic, you just start racking up hits like crazy because you're falling behind, and you're pressing buttons for action triggers that just passed. God damn it! This difficulty is impossible. Maybe if I had the twitch reflexes of a ten-year-old, but I can't even get past the first fucking screen. <sighs> okay, let's just see if I can jump straight back into the action, because if I have to watch these cutscenes over and over, I'm seriously gonna fucking lose it. Okay, I skipped that one, but- go, go. What the shit?! I'm taking hits for trying to skip a cutscene?! Have you ever played a game that punished you for trying to skip movies?! Imagine playing Metal Gear Solid 2 and trying to skip the codex scenes only for the colonel to reach through the screen and slap you across the face and say, Hey, listen, fuck bucket. I'm talking and you're gonna listen. I need scissors. 61. This is like playing a really shitty version of Dance Dance Revolution with a controller. The only way you'll ever be able to beat this game on this difficulty is by memorizing the button patterns, but that means watching the same scenes over and over again. It's the only way I ever managed to get this far. Zordon said these power morphers to give us power. Let's do it! So now I'm thinking, yeah, now it's on. Now I'm the Power Rangers. Now I'm badass. These guys got a serious ass kicking coming. Yeah, let's do this thing. We're gonna save the world! Come on, I'm supposed to have superpowers now, but the game just got twice as hard. God, I suck at this game. Okay, I'm skipping to the lower difficulty because it's the only way you're gonna see anything other than this. everything already. That was it. All you're doing is playing a Simon Says minigame and watching an entire series of Power Rangers chopped up into about 20 minutes. All it does is cut the fight scenes out and edits them together, so the game doesn't make any sense at all. All it is, is just Rita sends a monster, you kill it. Rita sends another monster, you kill it. And the, the difficulty to normal is a huge step down, too. So your choices are between an impossible expert mode and a normal mode, which is way too fucking easy. 
continuity is all over the place. In the next few stages, you have to fight the Green Ranger, because at this point in the series, he's evil. But then for absolutely no reason, this scorpion lady turns into a giant beast and attacks you. Who the fuck is she? Where did she come from? Rita also causes an eclipse, because the Megazord is apparently solar-powered, so the, through the entire stage, your life drains automatically. Can you imagine trying to play this on the hard difficulty, taking three times as many hits because you're screwing up, and your life is going down the drain automatically? This barely qualifies as a game. It's so disheartening that you have literally no impact on the game's outcome whatsoever. No matter what you do, whether you succeed or fail, nothing changes on the screen. It just plays out the same way as before. You're literally accomplishing nothing. In fact, the game doesn't even make any sense between levels. In several levels, the Power Rangers get their asses kicked, even if you press all the right buttons. They'll decisively lose a fight, and all the game will say is, Congratulations, you get to move on to the next level. In fact, at the end of one level, the Rangers' Power Swords are destroyed, and they don't ever defeat the monster. So what, was the Earth conquered? I guess not, because the next level, Rita sends another monster down, just like always. <laughs> it's all over the radio. A monster's attacking the business district. So, guess what the rangers do? Smart inside! They summon their zords! Who's fixing the zords anyway? Alpha? It's not like Zordon can do shit. Dude's got no arms. You think he's gonna be able to hold a spanner or change a fan belt? Would it have killed them just to make some kind of side-scrolling beat-em-up? Well, that's what you'd expect, right? Just some generic arcade-style game like the X-Men or Ninja Turtles arcades. This isn't complicated. You could code this game in Flash in about 10 minutes, and people would still say you phoned it in. Let me put it this way. You know those timing-based mini-games that everyone hates in games like Resident Evil 4, Indigo Prophecy, or Dead to Rights? Mighty Morphin Power Rangers is this timing-based mini-game. All of it. This game was so lousy that it actually wore out a shitty gaming fad about 10 years before the fad was even invented. But maybe you don't care. Maybe you might consider this a happy little piece of Karate Kaiju nostalgia. I'll admit I liked rocking out to the cheesy Power Rangers theme song, but all of a sudden the game just throws you a middle finger in between levels after a cliffhanger. After about the sixth level, the game says, Try Expert Mode to access the final levels of the game. You can't even finish the game on normal difficulty? What the fuck is that shit? How ripped off would you feel if you bought this game, paid upwards of 50 $60, and then just got the equivalent of something you would download off Xbox Live that chokes your access off after two levels. I mean, there's no way you're going to be able to see those last levels on expert difficulty. You saw what I went through. It's impossible. But you know what the worst part is? The absolute worst part of this game? No bulk and skull. Oh no, look who's here. Bulk and skull. Hi, girls. How about that double date we talked about? Yeah! <laughs> what about it? Sorry, guys. I don't know how you'd ever include them in a game, but those guys were the best. They had the greatest theme song ever. <laughs> we're not good enough for you? <sighs> not really sure what I'm gonna do now. I mean, I'm, I guess I might go back to Final Fantasy VIII. Haven't I really beat up on the Sega CD enough? It's not like these games could possibly get any worse anyway. Hey, uh, sorry everyone, I was just trying to make sure all my various bits were still attached. See, last time I tried to use the transporters here, my underwear materialized backwards. You see, here at That Guy With The Glasses, we're still using the old Mark I transporters without the multiplex pattern buffer, so it's only a matter of time before one of us gets transporter psychosis or something. Yeah, I mean, if you're not careful, you can come down with various symptoms like, uh, insomnia, acute myopia, painful spasms in the extremities, dehydration, and, um... Uh, that's not even getting into the... Ah! Damn it! That's not even getting into the various psychological issues like uh, hallucinations, paranoid delusions, dementia. And then, of course, there's the irrational fits of rage. Mm! God damn it! Son of a bitch! Ah! And who the hell are you? Seriously, what are you doing here? This guy is trashing my scene, man! I mean, here I am trying to do a review, and all of a sudden this... this fuzzy, weird, blue alien thing comes wandering onto the set all la di da di da di da and I'm trying to focus here, and hang on, my coke's ringing. Hello? <laughs> Beam me up, Mr. Scott. Sulu, go to warp. Warp 3, sir. No! That will be way too slow.
Today I'm reviewing Star Trek Borg, a game released in 1996, a time when most people had already given up on interactive movies as a pretty lame idea. In fact, by this point, most people had already given up on Star Trek as a pretty lame idea, too. What, you liked Star Trek Generations? Eat my balls! In this game, you play as Cadet Kalen Furlong, a trainee who joined Starfleet to one day avenge the death of his father at the hands of the Borg ten years ago. And luckily, you happen to be on the Enterprise on the very day the Borg re-emerged from the Delta Quadrant to attack. Unluckily, as a cadet, you're not qualified to squeegee the main view screen, so you're sent packing on a shuttlecraft to the nearest starbase. But that's when everyone's favorite omnipotent being Q appears, to give Kalen a shot at revenge. Perhaps I should introduce myself. I imagine you've heard of me, though, Q? It's short for Q. It was I, you know, who introduced Picard to the Borg, and it's because of me that ten years ago the Borg came to Wolf 359 and found that fleet of ships and found your father and killed them all. You want action? You want to avenge your father's death? You want to kill Borg? What I don't get is why Q offers you the chance at revenge seconds after he basically admits the entire Borg invasion is his fault. And it is. I mean, seriously, when you think about it, there's almost no point in being mad at the Borg. They're basically mindless automata. They'll assimilate anything. It's like trying to get revenge against bees because ten years ago a bee stung your father. It's what they do. They're bees. And you can't get revenge against Q because he's basically God. Maybe you didn't hear me. I'm offering you a chance to go and kill some Borg. Do you want to or not? Actually, you can by choosing to go home and not play a stupid game, but then it's game over. And to think I went to so much trouble to arrange it all. I like that they even give you a choice. You know, like, why do you even bother buying this game if you were just going to refuse to play it? But actually, it is a legitimate choice, because if you load the game up again, you're going to learn its first true hard lesson. You can't skip the movies. Ever. And the opening cinematic is like four minutes long. After seeing all this crap twice, you might just choose to exit the game all over again. Don't even bother. But for now, let's just assume that you play along. Q takes you into the past aboard the USS Righteous, a ship that was destroyed when the Borg originally attacked Wolf 359. He then proceeds to alter the past so that you take the place of Lieutenant Sprint, a redshirt who originally got killed by a boarding party. He then leaves it up to you to stop the Borg and save your dad. You're not afraid of a little space-time continuum meddling, are you, cadet? No, I thought not. Oh man, we are so gonna bend over the space-time continuum tonight. Q himself assumes the body of the ship's resident dickhead, Dr. Quint. He actually tried to save Sprint's life, but as you can see, he failed the old goat. Well, what'd you expect? He's a doctor, not a security officer. But he never really gets into the spirit of role-playing his part. I'm an omnipotent being masquerading as Dr. Quint. Whatever I want to happen, happens interesting fantasy. The game plays out like one of those super lethal choose your own adventure novels, only like a movie. Every now and then the game halts and gives you some time to make a choice, and there's only one right thing to choose. Every other choice, well... The Borg are firing! We're gonna die! And it's your fault. Well, I hope we're learning something from our little mistakes. Don't worry, we don't have to start completely over. This is Q we're talking about, remember? With a snap of his fingers, he can just bring it back to life whenever he wants. And he does. A lot. You're dead. Half a billion gigawatts will do that to you. The gimmick to this game is that whenever you die, Q just brings you back to life to the same decision point you died at so you can try again. Although I honestly think Q just orchestrated this entire thing to watch you, an entirely unqualified, untrained cadet play with highly hazardous equipment, and basically get shot, stabbed, blown up, electrocuted, and assimilated in increasingly comedic ways. And then, being God, he has the unique pleasure of resurrecting you and then rubbing your nose in your own festering pile of ashes. Weird. I know I'm going to hate myself in the morning, but I'm going to give you another chance. It's not that I care. I just want to see how it turns out. You'll learn rather quickly that this game keeps playing the same trick on you by offering you two obvious choices, both of which are going to get you killed. There's almost always a third option hidden somewhere on the screen, so my best advice to beating the game is to never click on the obvious choices. Click on anything else, and the less sense it makes, the better. What's annoying, though, is that the game is structured in such a way that the puzzles are basically unsolvable unless you force yourself to seek out every possible way to die. 
It's kind of clever, actually, and yet simultaneously very, very irritating. For instance, when you beam aboard the Borg Cube, you're given the option of shooting a couple of wandering drones. Now, fans of the show would realize that shooting drones is kind of a dumb move, since they'll just ignore you unless you pose an obvious threat, like shooting them. What are you looking at, cadet? But no matter what you do, when you try to access their computer, you get attacked and die. Instead, you're actually expected to go in phasers blazing just to get everyone killed and assimilated by the Borg. When you're part of the Collective, you're given all of their access codes, and then you die, and Q takes you back in time to a previous decision point where you can use the codes on the computer. And I'll admit, that kind of thinking is surprisingly innovative with the whole time travel concept, but instead of encouraging smart gameplay, it just sort of leads you to doing monumentally stupid things in the hope it'll provide you with future clues. It's a sort of an everything-including-the-kitchen-sink approach to gaming, and it also means you're going to be stuck watching the same unskippable movie scenes dozens and dozens of times! Ah! As for the acting, it's... well, it's Star Trek. Technology! Channels! Subspace channels! The Borg implant taking over systems! Sentence! Fragments! Can't finish! Complete thought! Resistance is... You will be assimilated! His mind full of dust bunnies and pain! Pain! The only thing that makes all this bearable is that John Delancey is always awesome as Q, and it's hard not to have fun when he's around being an insufferable prick. Ooh, I like this guy! Even so, you'll start to overdose on the Q after a while because he's everywhere, and he's always talking, talking, talking. He's always shoving shit in your face and saying neener, neener when you get killed. He's just too stupid to live. After a while, you just want to kick him in the nuts and go, SHUT UP! Oh! 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 I just kicked Q in the Joy Department. That can't be smart. But let's do it again. Oh! Uppercut! Uppercut! Oh! Oh! Seriously, the guy mugs and chews his way through entire decks of starship scenery. And luckily, all the scenery belongs to Star Trek Voyager, so who cares? I still like you. <laughs> he kissed me. Yeah, I may be omnipotent, but I'm not omnisexual. I'm not gay or anything. I love the pussy. Alright, now that's what I'm talking about. Hey, forget the Borg, man. Let's party. Hey, let's all have pizza and margarita. Shoot a Hey, why do you get to keep all the foxy chicks for yourself? Why? Because I can. <laughs> ah, well, that's Q for you. Hey, that brings us to the end of this review, but there's a lot more games out there, and I'd love to review them, but the only way you can see them is if everyone pitches in, because, after all, those Klingon language camp lessons are expensive. So, until next time, I'll see you out there. Live long and prosper. Halloween's right around the corner, and let me tell you, few things in this world scare me more than a game with full motion video, but, you know, not in that good way. I wanted to find a game that was actually really scary, an FMV title that really captured the spirit of Halloween, but when I tried finding an FMV game that actually set out to be scary, well... Disco dance! Disco dance! Disco dance! Yeah, you know, the scary part there is that was about as good as FMV games ever got, and it's remarkable to me that in all this time, you can still name all the good FMV games that were ever made on, like, one hand. And maybe it's just me, but this really isn't that hard to figure out. The good FMV games actually have, you know, actors. Guys like Mark Hamill, Biff, Malcolm McDowell, Billy D. Williams, 
Tim fucking Curry. To think you could master my science. <laughs> Brule. George Takei. You are made of stupid. The nature boy Ric Flair. Wait, no, sorry, I fucked up. Uh, uh, Christopher Walken? This guy is unfucking believable I can't even remember what point I was trying to make now, but even earlier than the very first CD-ROMs, you could still find a ton of full-motion video games. In the form of board games, that is. You're familiar with the game Dragon Strike, right? Well, there were a ton of other board games that incorporated fully produced VHS tapes as a much more integral part of the game, the most famous of which was Nightmare, or Atmosphere, as it would later be called. Actually, what's funny is the main reason they changed the title to Atmosphere was to avoid confusion with a popular British television series called Nightmare, which is something else I reviewed a long time ago. The game is one of the easiest I've ever played. You pick a character, you pick a number, you roll your dice, you move your mice, and you follow the instructions on the space you land. Sometimes you get cards to fuck with other people, and sometimes you don't. All you have to do is eventually get six keys and be the first to get to the center of the board and not draw the card you wrote your worst nightmare on before 60 minutes have passed on screen. It really is one of the most simplistic, brain-dead games I've ever seen. It basically plays itself. All you do is you roll and you move, and you play most cards automatically in response to something happening, like when someone lands on your gravestone, or the moment a specific time passes. I think the only real challenge to this game is that eventually you get so many cards, it's hard to remember what you've got, and you're waiting for like a dozen different times to pass. The game is still really easy, but at the same time, it's hard to win, if that makes sense, because the whole time you're playing... <laughs> ah! The Gage Keeper! Oh, yeah, I forgot to turn the TV down, sorry. This guy can get a little loud, hang on. Um, when I speak, you will stop. And you will listen! Yeah, man. Hmm? So, yeah, the star of this whole thing is the gatekeeper, this guy who likes to periodically interrupt the game and yell at the players and inflict bullshit punishments on them for things like uh, rolling the dice poorly or not yelling, yes, my gatekeeper, whenever he appears on screen. I know he's supposed to be scary, but when I played, nobody could even keep a straight face around when he was on the screen. It's just that whenever he does show up, he startles the fuck out of everybody because there's this huge fucking thunderclap and Jesus Christ! It will pay dearly. Don't do that! You will be punished! What? Me? Yes, you! Answer me, you maggot! What? What, what did I do? You must answer, yes, my gatekeeper! Oh, that. Sorry, I should have explained. I, I'm not actually playing the game. I just put the tape in to show people what... Do it! Don't waste my time, for you have precious little of it. No, no, you, you don't understand. I'm not actually playing the game, I'm just reviewing it for my website. Huh? I'm doing a review of your game for my website. D Comprende website? It's called The Spoonie Experiment? That is a stupid name, isn't it, you maggot? <laughs> no, cuz I'm Spoonie. I think it is. So do all the others. Yeah, it's kind of a long story about this old Final Fantasy game for the Super Nintendo where there's this uh, character named Edward who's a bard. And Anyway, somebody calls Edward a spoony bard, and I just thought it was a really funny word because I had no idea what it means. And So I used it for my Dungeons & Dragons character, and then one thing led to another. How old are you? Okay, first of all, Dungeons & Dragons is a very adult game, and I resent the implication that it's an image... Answer me, old maggot! 28... That old. Look, it's supposed to be nerdy, okay? I'm an entertainer. This is what I do. I review nerdy bullshit like this for laughs. Everybody must pity you. No, oh, actually, as far as internet critics go, I think I'm pretty popular. I, I think. I mean, everyone seems to love the, the, the robot and the reviews and the website. They won't soon. They'll hate you like I do. Yeah, but what other choice do I have? I mean, it's not like I set out wanting to do this bullshit. I mean, I had prospects at one time. I got a college education. Computer science, I thought that was a good idea, but no. I mean, I could have been anything. I could have been a doctor, or a filmmaker, or the kid from The Last Starfighter. You can blame it on the others, not me. 
Okay, seriously, I'm getting really stressed out now, so why are you here and fucking up my whole review, dude? You ask why? Because I can. Because I'm the gatekeeper! And this is my game! And your nightmare! <laughs> wait, 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 did you just scronk on me? Like to meet me on the other side, little one? <laughs> Enjoy your fall down into the black hole. <laughs> bye bye. Yeah, the black hole, or as he calls it, the black hole. Banish to the black hole. 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 If you land in there by accident, or the gatekeeper banishes you there, you don't get to move until he lets you out, or someone lands on this space. By landing on this space, you have released... You know, for a game meant to be played in the dark, this game has a lot of reading and a really strange font. Mostly the cards are a complete waste of time. Like, when you draw a time card, it tends to be either useless, or it refers to a time that's already passed. A lot of the cards will tell you to scream in other people's ears in some attempt to scare them, which is a great way to take their fake cards and get punched in the fucking head. The game kind of assumes you're playing with all six people, because many of the cards and spaces on the board refer to exact characters and numbers, and if they're not playing, I guess you just ignore them. And that's a pretty big assumption. I'm in a weekly board gaming club, and do you know how hard it is for me to find five other players interested in playing a good game? I hate the chance cards. They're useless. They all say things like, if you're the mummy Khufu and your number is four, flip a coin. If you get heads, receive a key. So, okay, not only do I have to land on a chance space and have one of the six possible characters on the card, and have the right random number out of six possible, I have to win a 50-50 coin toss on top of that. So, statistically, each card is what, a 1 in 72 chance at best? Less, actually, since there are also key cards in the chance deck. If you get both halves, you get a key, but when I played, by the end of the game I had like a million fucking key cards, but they were all the same half. Is someone just holding on to a similar hand of cards, just with the other half of the key? Well, no, because I looked through the entire chance deck, and you know how many cards had the other half of the key on it? One! Fucking one! The phrase needle in a fucking haystack springs to mind! So, what?! Look at me, you maggot! Yes! Look at me! Do not stand away from me! You will stare down deep into my eyes and keep looking at me until I fade away! What, like a staring contest? Don't blink, maggot. If you blink just once, you've shown me your weakness. I'll take a key from you. Hold it! Lee from Still Gaming! So, you want a staring contest, huh? You think you can take me? Go ahead on. Hey, how did you get into my house? Let's do this! Don't blink, little maggot. I'm watching you. I see you. pick a -boo. Don't blink, you little maggot. Fair to you all. Oh, dude, look, you totally made him cry. I have been good to you all. <laughs> On occasion. That's right, I told you not to mess with my boy Lee here. Now, are you gonna keep being a cunt bucket or are you gonna be good and let Spoonie finish his review? Now I choose to be good. Okay then. I'm gonna go make waffle. Cake. Believe it or not, there's actually something worse than being in the black hole. At about 10 minutes in, it was my turn, and then the gatekeeper told me I couldn't play again until I rolled a 6 on my turn. You must roll a 6 to play again. You know how fucking long it took me to roll a 6? A half hour! I sat there with my thumb up my ass for a half hour because I couldn't roll a fucking 6! 
The only thing worse than that is when the gatekeeper tells the oldest player to sit there and hold the whole game up until he can roll his age exactly on one die. If he goes over, he has to start over. So yeah, if you didn't know what your worst nightmare was before, trust me, it's sitting on your ass doing nothing but watch your dad try to roll his own age on one six-sided die for a half hour. And you know what? Even though I literally sat out three quarters of this game in the black hole and trying to roll a six, I still won! Because during the last two minutes of the game, the gatekeeper just gives away all the keys he didn't have before. So the winner of this game is completely fucking arbitrary! The other players wanted to fucking kill me after I won because I wasted an hour of their lives like this. And, you know, you're only ever going to play this game one time. Even if you really liked it or you thought the video was good for a laugh, once you've seen it, well, that's basically it. It's not going to be any different the next time. There's no replay value, and that's a tough sell for a board game. Oh! Who the hell are you? I am the gate cleaner. Ah, yeah, I thought you were, you know, the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper is my uncle who got me this job. Well, you don't sound like you enjoy it very much. No! I get paid minimum wage, but I have to buy my own cleaning supplies! Does that sound fair to you, little maggot? Answer me! No, no, it sounds like it sucks, and uh, maybe you should take it up with management or something. Um, listen, I just finished this review, so uh, maybe I better wrap this up and go before... Oh, finished. You think you finished my game so easily? There were sequels! <laughs> Your nightmares just begun, Spoony Web. Sequels? Oh, he's high. Oh man! Is that enough replay value, maggot? You have one year to review all the games. If you fail, you will be punished. I'd like to punish you now. You are banished until you have cleaned the black hole. Wait a minute, clean the black hole? That's not fair! Welcome back to FMV Hell, Spoony One. For when you enter the black hole, you enter the world of Pumpkinhead. Озвучил псих. Набор текста винам. Перевела Доминика. to the black hole. <laughs>